Thank you, Maricelis, and thank you everyone for joining today. I wanted to give a quick summary of the role of wheat uh, in the current crisis, and also uh, some of the response agenda proposed by, by Simmons to address this. So I've called this presentation Wheat in Fields of War, uh, really to highlight the, the impacts of conflict on wheat, not just today, but also throughout history. Uh, and we really see conflict uh, and uh, issues in the global, global community, global supply chain, uh, having great impacts on the vulnerability of our global food systems. So this statue, Let Us Beat Swords into, into Plowshares, stands in the Garden of the United Nations. Uh, and it was donated during the Cold War as a reminder of the link between conflict and agricultural production. So really it depicts the, the transformation of weapons of war uh, into, into, into things that create so, so plowshares and things that allow us to produce uh, food. Uh, and since the eighth century teachings of Isaiah in the Old Testament, we really see this intricate link between agriculture and conflict in theology and philosophy. Uh, and in literature. Uh, and it's really important to have this historical context to, to really understand that conflict and agriculture uh, are really intricately linked. Uh, and this is really a foundational piece of how we deliver food security uh, and really look at how we stabilize uh, food uh, for the world. So again, if we look at the complexity and frequency of events that impact the global food system, we can look at the food price index and look at these trends uh, in, the recent, in the recent past uh, and see that firstly see that cereal prices, uh, which are driven primarily by wheat, uh, are really linked to the food price index. So how, how expensive it is for people to buy and access food. Uh, and so we can see that, that wheat, are really good, wheat is a really good predictor of the food price index. Uh, and we can see these spikes which occur over time uh, in and eight in 2011, uh, and recently here in 2022. Uh, and we know from the, the past that the price spikes uh, in 2000 in particular, uh, and also in 2011, caused really significant social unrest uh, and food instability, particularly in the global south. So in 2008, we saw uh, bread riots uh, and really people experiencing violence as they, uh, as they tried to procure and purchase food to sustain their daily lives. Uh, and again, the same thing happened in 2011, where we see really uh, inability to access staple foods, uh, having a really significant impact on local communities uh, and livelihoods. And so we really ask this question in the current context of the Ukraine-Russia war uh, and the impacts of that on wheat supply and availability. Really, we need to be able to understand uh, what can be done to, to really mitigate uh, and build greater resilience to avoid these price spikes uh, and this uh, the knock-on effects for the availability uh, and affordability of wheat as a staple food supply. So here at CIMIT, we've been trying to really highlight these impacts, particularly on vulnerable communities in the global south, uh, to, really, to really link the supply of wheat uh, to food security and the alleviation of hunger. So we've both highlighted this as well as proposed a response agenda uh, that sets up uh, a number of strategies that we propose uh, across a number of science areas, uh, disciplines and areas of expertise to try and stabilize global wheat supplies for food security. And we think this is really important because we're uh, stabilizing supply, building resilience in our supply chains uh, is really fundamental to continuing to provide wheat to 2.5 billion people who consume it around the world. Uh, the pictures on the right here also show new work that we've now initiated in East Africa, targeting specifically the limited supply uh, of wheat in the mills in East Africa at this time, which has significant potential uh, impacts and implications for food security uh, in the region. So if we look at the core, some of the causes of the current uh, wheat supply crisis, uh, we can see uh, here in these uh, maps on the left-hand side, uh, annual wheat uh, exports uh, and imports. So we have really a concentration of export supply, which has happened in the relatively recent past. So we have a few players in the global wheat uh, market, uh, including both Russia and the Ukraine, uh, providing a, a really high proportion of the world's wheat for imports. 
Uh, and then if we look at the picture on wheat imports in countries, so who's actually importing this wheat from these major export providers, uh, we see a concentration of uh, reliance on wheat imports, uh, and these have typically been quite cheap imports of wheat uh, in the global south. So we see a lot of production concentrated in a small number of countries, including importantly in the current context, Ukraine and Russia, uh, and then a concentration of dependence on this, this uh, wheat as a source of imports uh, in the global south. And this concentration of supply uh, is really one of the key uh, things we, we think need to be addressed by the global community, uh, because we know that concentration of supply introduces the vulnerability uh, and the impact that we've seen in the current uh, crisis. Uh, and this issue of concentration of supply is not just seen in the wheat uh, value chain and the wheat supply chain, we also see this in many aspects of our lives. So I'm sure many of you, uh, myself included, um, buy consumer goods, retail goods from a, a much smaller number of uh, online companies than we perhaps previously did. Uh, and we see the same impacts of this concentration of supply uh, in our daily lives um, when we walk down a high street or, or try to buy something, <laughs> a physical thing, uh, we're no longer, often no longer able uh, to do that. So when things are, when the supply is concentrated, uh, it works very well. We can access things with the click of a button, receive it the next day. Uh, but when it's out of stock, uh, we suddenly uh, And so we see this in the wheat market. We see it in our, our daily lives and our retail consumption. Uh, and we've also seen it in the current uh, context in, in the provision of microchips uh, and the implications of that for the supply chains of consumer electronics all the way through to, to new cars. So this is really a, an issue. Uh, and if we look over time on this, um, this dependency on cereal imports, which have typically been uh, priced very competitively, which has driven the, the continued reliance on imports, uh, we see that this has been growing over time in Africa and Asia. So two of the target regions of the CIMIC Level Wheat Program. So whilst in Europe, the, the reliance on cereal trade has actually reduced over time, we see that in Africa and Asia, the reliance on imports of cereals, which are really a staple food supply. So the reliance on food security essentially has been growing over time uh, and is forecast to grow even more in to, to 2030 in, in both of these regions. So this is really problematic not only because there's this dependency on the availability of, of cereals to import, uh, but because there's an unequal uh, dependency, uh, particularly in the global south. We can also see really growing, growing gaps between production uh, and demand uh, with different patterns of urbanization. Uh, and this graph shows uh, wheat supply and demand in Africa. Uh, and so we know that demand for wheat uh, is increasing and has been increasing for some time while well, production of wheat uh, in Africa uh, has stayed stable or in some places uh, decreased. Uh, and so this really leads to, to a growing gap between the production and the, the necessity to import wheat uh, to, to fulfill this demand. And this has also uh, driven the, the vicious cycle of the availability of cheap imports from concentrated supply uh, has, has led to decisions about production and where production is prioritized and occurs. Uh, and we see this really visually, as I mentioned, in East Africa. So if we look at the port of Mombasa, really uh, the wheat comes in on very large container ships, is all processed in this infrastructure, uh, which is at the, at the dock, uh, and then is progressed through the value chain to provide wheat, uh, which is growing in demand. Uh, and we can see a, a typical wheat grist, uh, the, the flour uh, relied on um, by the milling industry, um, is really kind of composed almost 60% for the predominance of Russia and Ukraine wheat um, to really supply the demand in East Africa. So this, this is a real problem at this time uh, because these boats are not arriving into the port of Mombasa uh, and these silos are, are emptying. Uh, and we, we do see really a significant um, potential for, for great destabilizing impacts uh, of this uh, lack of availability uh, and high prices uh, and what they mean all through the wheat value chain as well as the people who rely on wheat uh, as a part of their daily uh, daily dietary requirements. 
So as I mentioned, we've been proposing some short, medium and long-term uh, solutions uh, and these are laid out in this recent paper. Uh, the link is here. Uh, and this brings together many different experts um, from CIMIT and our partner organizations to, to look at really what we propose to be done, not just to mitigate the impacts of the current crisis, uh, but also in the longer term to stabilize the supply of wheat uh, and to make sure these inequitable impacts uh, are reduced. So in the short term, uh, we, we describe these in much more detail in the paper, uh, but we see real potential for boosting production. A lot of this is, is plant breeding uh, and uh, agronomy and all of the, the uh, packages of solutions around this. Ensuring access is really about how we um, use wheat in the market context. So wheat for food versus wheat for feed, uh, subsidies and incentives that can be given, which also encompass fertilizer, uh, another really, um, core component of our agricultural systems where we see reduced supply at this time. Uh, and securing supply, uh, this is uh, new work that we're doing, working on blending uh, of wheat flowers in order to, to mitigate the current price spike, particularly in, in East Africa. In the medium term, we're looking at targeted expansion of wheat. Obviously, this is not possible in all geographies and, and needs to uh, take into account the the agroecological settings in which wheat's produced, as well as government policies uh, and directions on expansion and priorities for wheat production. Linked to this is the development of self-sufficiency pathways, where we again see really the portfolio of plant breeding, uh, agronomy, bundled packages uh, to, to provide uh, wheat that can be produced uh, very effectively and efficiently in different parts of the world. Uh, and then very, very relevant to the work of BGRI, and I know Dave Hodson's also presenting, uh, is, it, is about our monitoring capacity, both for plant pathogens, uh, but also for understanding where wheat's produced uh, and how vulnerabilities are detected. Having early warning systems, not just for pathogens, but for other stresses in the system, such as conflict, such as climate change impacts, uh, and really the necessity to, to have greater monitoring capacity that provides a comprehensive and transparent data. In the longer term, and these are really not things that we think we can wait to the longer term to, to deploy, but are things that we need to start thinking about now in, to, in order to secure the long-term stability of our wheat system, uh, is really looking at these drivers of agroecosystem diversity and how we achieve our sustainability goals whilst also maintaining the production that we know is needed uh, to sustain the world's population. We also see a really important uh, role for understanding and addressing gender disparities that we know uh, exist in rural households and rural communities and in different regions of the world in the farming communities. Uh, and here it's really important to recognize that when we propose something like boosting production, actually this changes potentially the gender dynamics of how wheat's produced uh, because it becomes that it, it, it potentially moves out of another cropping system another production system which may have different gender roles and we really need to be able to understand these uh, at scale uh, in order to to move forward effectively uh, with with our multiple goals of, of ensuring gender equality ensuring food security and ensuring the sustainability of our wheat production systems uh, and then obviously the final one is about increasing investment which is something i'm sure we all would like to see uh, but we really argue that that having sustained investment uh, in the stability of our global wheat system uh, is a hugely beneficial uh, thing, to, thing to do uh, in terms of both stabilizing food supply, but also food and nutritional security uh, and the security of the most vulnerable uh, reliance on wheat around the world. So with that, uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to present. Uh, we, we've obviously, uh, there's much more detail in the papers that I, that I mentioned uh, and I really welcome uh, any discussion or questions. Thanks, Marcella. Thank you, Alison. Um, so th uh, those of you in the that just joined us, uh, thank you for joining us today. You just heard from Alison Bentley. Um, so we are ready to take some questions um, from the audience. Uh, please write your questions in the Q and A using the Q and A feature, or using uh, the chat. Um, while we get um, some questions started from the community, Alison, um, thank you so much first for the summary of where we are because it's difficult sometimes to, to track 
what does it mean? Like, for example, conflict or climate change, you know, we have been talking about um, at the BGRI a lot about, you know, the threat of, of diseases, but like you said, we need to be monitoring much more than just diseases. So how do you see our community supporting that effort and, and what do we need to get in place to be able to do that effectively? Yeah, thanks for the question. And I think it's it's a great one and one we've been discussing with, with Dave and others in the monitoring community. So I think you have the need for, again, sustained, um, sustained communities and sustained commitment to the monitoring of, of emerging pests and pathogens. Uh, and, and I think that's clear. Obviously, a lot of advances have been made with the use of genomics and all of these tools, many of which you'll probably hear about today. Uh, and really, I think we want to see that scaled up and deployed systematically. So not reliant on a project by project basis or a single country being able to deploy a surveillance system, but the ability to link those together um, and to have the data available uh, in real time from multiple geographies and uh, multiple different locations um, in a single place. Then I think the, the new opportunity exists also to, to deploy the genomics-based monitoring in the seed trade. So we see diseases like wheat blast, which have moved around the world, um, which has been hypothesized uh, and, and I think shown um, through sequencing evidence to be the result of pathogens moving alongside the, the, the trade of seed. Uh, and we really see a big potential to deploy genomics based solutions for tracking seed as it moves around the world and the pathogens that might be um, being moved with the grain trade. Um, and there we, we highlight some of the opportunities that might exist with COVID testing laboratories, which now exist everywhere around the world. So can we turn those all into kind of pathogen genomics um, facilities? So instead of getting your, your COVID test before you take a flight, um, a batch of seed gets a COVID, gets a, a COVID like pathogen test before it gets on a ship um, to go to another part of the world. And, and I think we really wanna see that systematically implemented because implementing it on a country by country basis has obviously been shown to be very effective. Um, but if we, can, if we can link that together across the global um, wheat system, I think we'll have a lot more power um, to make decisions and to, to have the information before we need it, before things um, become real, really become threats to production. Thanks, Alison. And I'm just looking at questions from the audience. And um, Asif Islam um, asks, apart from biotic stresses, abiotic stresses is now a day, um, now a, a day in a question, how to address it. So we're talking about abiotic stresses, you know, I think it links to that monitoring system, but also about what CIMIT and all the breeding programs are doing to address um, abiotic stresses, but also monitoring them and to be able to react to it. Yeah, it's another great question. Uh, and it's something that we have also been trying to highlight in this response agenda, that this coming back to the concentration of supply uh, of wheat to the global market, you can kind of see if five countries are uh, supplying global wheat and there's a conflict between two of them, we see what we, we currently see in terms of supply and prices. But we also see that if one of those countries or multiple countries have a significant heat, droughts, um, flooding event, and it means that wheat's not available on the global market, then that also has significant uh, impacts on global wheat. Uh, and we saw that this season uh, in South Asia with the, the heat wave really happening right at the end of the season, um, and which reduced yields by, by six to 10% um, in, in different parts of South Asia. Uh, and that had really big implications because uh, India had planned to, to contribute uh, in terms of exports, um, to, to the stability of global supply, but that, that obviously, that heat event meant that it was not possible to do so because of the, the yield impacts um, of that. And, and we see the same in, in North America, really extreme temperatures at the moment, um, and, and really these abiotic stress, um, the biotic stresses, as well as the abiotic stresses, really um, adding on to each other and creating this perfect storm. And so obviously Simit and many others are, are working to, to kind of build the resilience. Uh, and I think that's one of the themes of, of the IWC this year. And it's really important how we build that resilience piece uh, and how we, we kind of reconcile it with, with boosting production. So boost production, ensure resilience, deliver on our sustainability targets, deliver on our equality targets. Uh, this is really complex um, to do. 
Uh, and I know Liana from, from the CIMIT Week program is presenting uh, later in the session about some of the work that's that's underway to try and understand, better understand how we can respond um, to some of these uh, heat and drought stress um, events and build this resilience alongside boosting production and, and doing all of the other things we need to do. Yeah, Alison, um, when reading your paper, one of the areas that I was really intrigued about was your suggestion in, in starting to think about the blending. Um, and to me, that struck me as a really good, like right away thing that we can do. Yes, of course, we wanna continue to increase production and secure that wheat supply. Uh, but tell us a little bit more where you are in this idea and, and how do you see this working? Yeah, it's a great opportunity, I think, particularly uh, in import dependent countries. Uh, and so we're, we're in, we've started this work now in East Africa. And as you say, it was something we could start almost immediately. Uh, and here we're really proposing to, to do flour blending, which has been done before, really from a nutrition and health context. But to say, can we use blending as a way to reduce the price um, of a consumer good, which is bread or a chapati or, or something that a consumer will, will buy? Uh, so in East Africa, where there is very limited uh, import of wheat at this time, uh, we've started working with the, the largest miller in East Africa to develop flour blends. Uh, and this work is, is using um, uh, millets and sorghum to say, can we substitute two, five, ten percent of wheat flour with the flours of these, these other uh, crops, which also offer potentially other benefits as well as price. So we're creating these cereal blends with commercial mills to make sure it really represents what, what is actually possible uh, to do at scale. Uh, and then testing, Itria Eber at Simit is leading the work to test the functional properties. Do we retain all the functional properties? Can we make bread? Uh, and then Sarah, Sarah Kariuki from the team uh, is doing a lot of consumer testing. So do consumers, can consumers, do consumers still want to test to eat these products, which is obviously really important um, when doing this this work at scale. So Sarah's doing a lot of work in peri-urban and urban settings in East Africa to say, okay, if we can create plants, if we can functionally test them, use them to make chapatis or bread, do people want to eat them? Uh, and these are really important questions and really exciting for us as breeders to, to be out on street corners uh, in peri-urban Nairobi, asking people if they want to eat something and then working backwards, kind of how do we breed for this? How do we make sure we provide um, these things into the market. So really exciting new work that we were able to start um, immediately working on and I think has, has really great potential. Very cool. I'm super excited to see where this is going and in the capacity of our community to, to look at the problem more holistically. So we are not concentrating on one trade, one, one product. We're saying, how does wheat fit, uh, fit in, in, in nutrition, in society? How do we secure uh, food security? Because at the end of the day, that's what we, we're here for. Uh, if we have to reinvent our, the way we look at where, the role of wheat and, and how it can really support all their value chains, I think it's really exciting. So we look forward to the updates on this in the years to come. Um, I know there's several questions in the chat that are mostly about a bi biotic stresses. So we're going to have a full session on this. So I would say, hold on to your questions and we're going to get to those questions when we get to that session. So thank you so much, Alison. And now we're going to move to our technical session.